Carrie. Thank you so much for joining. I'm so excited to talk to you today. I've been looking forward to talking with you too. Good. So when I reached out and you had a topic of interest you wanted to talk about, I am really excited about this topic because it's not something I know a lot about. Mm. And I'm really interested to um, hear what it's about, also your personal experience around it. And I think we're going to build a little bit of awareness for other people out there. So I'm really excited to to hear about it. And mm. you refer to it as DCIS. So will you tell us what that stands for and what it is, a little summary of it? Yes. Um, it's called DCIS stands for ductal carcinoma in situ and its street name is stage zero breast cancer okay so stage zero tells me hmm what what does that mean exactly exactly <laughs> that's the issue because it's not an invasive cancer is it cancer at all they are abnormal cancerous cells within a milk duct in usually a woman's breast, but also a man's breast. Okay. So how they get discovered, these abnormal cells, is through mammograms. And as we all know, um, we have a lot of pressure on us as women from a lot of different PR campaigns to go get a mammogram. And it turns out that mammograms are very, very um, sophisticated at finding singular abnormal cells in our breasts. And when, when there's an abnormal cell in the milk duct, it's like it's in a straw. That's how the breast surgeon explained it to me. And since it's in a straw, it's not getting out into your breast or your body. It's, it's an abnormal cell in a straw. And the, the industry calls that stage zero breast cancer, which okay. makes women very nervous. So when I looked it up, it said that there's a very low risk of it becoming invasive. Mm -hmm. That's your understanding. Okay. Because it's encased in this milk duct, right? Okay. Yes. There are, um, honestly, I don't think anybody really knows the real statistics because nobody studies it because mm -hmm. the moment a woman hears cancer and the, the medical industry has set it up this way, of course you want to get it out. Right. Of course you can have a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, even though it's not invasive, but right. it gets related to like that. And not only, you know, the patient, but the doctor is trained to diagnose cancer, then get it out, right? Yeah. Yes. And there's also a standard of care protocol. So even if you're a doctor who's saying, gee, I don't know, um, you know, lots of women die of other causes and natural causes at the end of their lives, and you do an autopsy, and they have DCIS in their breast, and it never went anywhere. Then the statistics are 15 to 20% of women with DCIS will get invasive breast cancer. So the real breast cancer, it's slow, it's slow moving, it, you would move to stage one. Um, and but, so but those that, are the statistics that the industry says. Does that necessarily mean that those abnormal cells in the milk duct actually became invasive, or is it possible that that woman was prone to get breast cancer anyway and other cells kind of came in? Well, that's a great question. And for the people who are concerned around overdiagnosis and overtreatment, that's that's the world of the, the people who are concerned around DCIS that that that's the world that's called overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And what they point out is that if DCIS were, 
if um, removing DCIS from a woman's breast was so preventive of breast cancer, how come breast cancer rates haven't been plummeting down, downward? Right. It's um, the estimate is in U.S. sixty thousand women a year are diagnosed with DCIS. Wow. Mm -hmm. Most of those women, ninety eight percent of those women, will choose some kind of invasive treatment, some okay. kind of surgery, which then there's all kinds of things that follow off of that. And is surgery typically the course of action the doctor is going to suggest? Yeah, they will suggest, depending on the doctor, um, and it's either a lumpectomy followed by radiation and tamoxifen or a mastectomy. So you personally got diagnosed with this, yes? Mm -hmm. So do you want to speak a little bit to that in your experience? Sure. Okay. Um, and this is, this is, yes. Yeah, so I went in for my routine mammogram. I finished my routine mammogram and somebody I didn't know said, um, I'm taking you to the radiologist now. And I walk into a little office with a woman I've never met before in my life who said to me before I could even sit down, you could have cancer. Wow. I said, Did, is there a lump? No, but right. um, I was told I needed, it, I was, it was told that I had a suspicious calcification. Um, the next step is you get a biopsy. And if I had known then what I know now, I never would have even gotten the biopsy. But I waited until I could change insurance because my existing insurance didn't cover a biopsy. And my OBGYN said, you can wait. This is not a fast moving thing here. Most of us and myself included in different ways, you know, we, we want to be good health, health, preventive health people. You go to get your mammogram. We go to get the preventive things. And then it, it does open up the door because the technology can see way more than it could have seen 30 years ago. So the technology can see things, but the medical industry hasn't caught up in understanding what it's looking at. Mm. So what the, to your point earlier, what, what the medical industry knows how to do is get it out. Right. Um, so I found this great Facebook group called DCIS is not cancer. And I found these other women who had said, whoa, slowing down the process here. You don't get to cut me up. Wow. Um, I can, why can't I do imaging every six months and see if the thing changes? Why do we have to cut it out right away? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm lucky, you know, lots of women, they go to that meeting with the surgeon and before they even get home, there are messages on their machine to schedule the surgery, to schedule the mastectomy, to schedule the reconstructive surgery. So it's very, you know, it's a very emotional um, process and experience. And it can be very lonely also, because if you even begin to consider not rushing to surgery, everybody in your life says, what are you doing? You have cancer. It can be very intimidating. And like you said, lonely. I mean, even sitting yeah. in the doctor's office, whether you're talking to the radiologist or the surgeon or whoever it is. And they have this huge sense of urgency and, and scare tactics yeah. maybe dating because, you know, the doctor yeah. doesn't care for you to ask questions. She just wants to direct, you know, what's going to happen next. And yeah, it is, it's uncomfortable, um, scary. Yes. Yes. And often, and I think what you're saying is important. Oftentimes we do these things by ourselves, mm -hmm. which makes us even more vulnerable. I may uh, once this process started, I made sure I always had somebody with me meeting with a doctor. Oh, nice. Um, and, uh, and worked hard to find the couple of people in my life who would support my decision. Right. And that's very hard also. And I also want to add, 
we're all different. I'm, um, so I made my decision based on my medical history and my family's history. Other women will make other decisions, mm -hmm. have different histories. Mm -hmm. um, so it's still very much a personal choice, but I'm healthy. I'm athletic. I don't have a history of cancer in my family. I refuse to take the gene test. The hardest part about this process is my willingness to swim in the unknown. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Honestly, even the women who go through surgery still don't know. It could still come back. And to trust my body. Good for you. Itself. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I, I have a question. So mammograms never felt like a good idea to me. <laughs> and mm. I'm in my 50s now and I have not had a mammogram, but I did um, a couple years ago get, a, I think they call it heat thermography image. Yes. So it's yeah. completely non-invasive. It's kind of like, you know, yeah. a picture taken of the, the heat. And then if you get them on a regular basis, you kind of get a baseline and you get them on a regular basis and they can identify abnormalities and things like that. So that's all I've done as far as my preventative breast health. Yes. Um, do you have any comments about that and what yeah. maybe share what you're doing moving forward? Yes. Um, there's a lot of information out there of women who are critiquing mammograms and um, that we are radiating ourselves every time we get a mammogram and that in itself could cause cancer. I'm not an expert. I don't know all the levels of radiation. And um, I myself uh, am now transitioning out of any mammograms. I've gone now three years since this diagnosis and not, and I've continued to have mammograms for that baseline. Nothing's changed, but I've had mammograms and ultrasound for several years anyway, because of dense breasts, which if half of half of women's breasts are dense, then yeah. I don't know why that's a special category, but anyway, I've, I've been told that too. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm doing ultrasound is where I'm headed. I decided not to do an MRI because there's as, as many false positives in, within an MRI and you take this blue liquid that isn't good for you either. And I'm not an expert, but I, um, I lead an emotional support group of women who have decided to, um, they've made their own decisions actually, but they want the emotional support of how, dealing with this diagnosis and navigating the health system and loved ones and emotional issues that come up. So um, I, I, I am with women who are like experts at the different imaging options and which one is better for this and which one is better for that. There's, there are more options out there than mammograms. Many women, if they decide to watch and what's called watch and wait or active surveillance, they go, they decide to totally change their uh, lifestyle, change what they eat, change how they're exercising and, or do alternative treatments and all of those things cost a lot of money that you pay out of pocket for. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, th thank you for sharing that. You mentioned you um, do some group therapy. Will you just tell our listeners mm -hmm. um, what you do for a living and how you help others? Sure. My, um, thank you for asking. And you're writing a book. Yes. So I'll okay. subject. So my coaching practice is called ZPD coaching, Zebra Peter David coaching, which you can find online. And um, I use a social therapeutic group based approach to emotional growth. And um, so I, I work with people who want to grow emotionally, transform their lives. They're going through a, a transition um, want to improve their relationships in life. So I, I work with couples. I lead groups, heterogeneous groups, all different people, all walks of life, all different emotional issues. But because of my passion around this issue, I also lead a specific DCIS emotional support group. 
and yes. um, at a discounted rate. And I just, I feel so passionately about this issue that of we need, we all need support in this world. The world is going mad and we can't survive it alone. We need, we need others with us. And um, that's why I'm, I, it's a group based approach that I practice. I'm very passionate about that. So women come together who've been diagnosed with DCIS and no matter where they land in their decision-making, the, the group creates an environment or a container as they're called now, um, where women can be emotional and vulnerable and go through a process and their own decision-making process of how they want to handle um, their situation. Yeah. So important. We just, yeah. so important to have that support so that, like you said, it can be a very lonely process going through something like that yourself. And you, you recognize that and you want to prevent that for, for other women. Yes. And importantly, my groups, there's no litmus test other than you've been diagnosed with DCIS. So, so women can be in the group and come to totally different decisions of how they're going to, but mm -hmm. everybody supports each other in their process. That's nice. what's powerful and beautiful about it. Amazing. Oh my gosh. Thank you for all that you do. Such a, such a role model and inspiration for all of us. Thank you, Carrie. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for having me on. And I mm -hmm. really, I know you as a, a leader and an innovator in alternative health. And I'm really thrilled to be that you asked me to be on this podcast, whatever it is, video. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it has been my honor. Thank you so much. Yeah.